today in studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, and Delegate Lawrence Kump. Larry, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, and for short and for certain, may God bless you all real good. Are you uh, the second or the third? Of what? Of the Kumps. I'm a long line of Kumps. No, I'm not a junior. You're not a junior? No. Okay, I thought there was a number after you. No, no. You, Infinite. No, you, you have uh, a relation in the past that was a governor? Herman Guy Kump, a uh, shirt tail cousin of mine, was governor in 1932. In fact, he's the one that implemented the state income tax. Oh, so he's popular. Not, <laughs> not in our family. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and what was the relation? How did it work out? He's a cousin. Cousin. Yeah. I was 14 when he died. Did you know him? No. I, I'm curious. Uh in 1932, starting income tax, that was the height of the Depression when folks did not have two cents anyway. So how could they set up a state income tax when folks are already starving to death? Well, in 1932, they also redid the Constitution. That's when we lost the county road system, yeah. uh, and that's when in West Virginia became so centralized because people were panicking because of the Depression. Uh, it was a mess, and they were well-intentioned, but I think they took – that's the point where West Virginia started to lose their ranking as far as economic prosperity among the other states. Yeah, I understand. It was uh, when the Constitution rewritten. It's just that these two things are inconsistent. One, that you people starve in, mm -hmm. and second, you implement an income tax. Right, right. I, I agree. Yeah. Odd, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in regards to the governor's current proposal of adding 5% to the triggering mechanism of 3 to 4%, Larry, how are you in regards to the math on that? Well, I'm going to take a careful look at it because we want to make sure that we have the money in the coffers to do that. Uh, but my position is generally any time we can give more money back to the taxpayers, you know, so that we've taken less money out of their pockets, I'm in favor of it. So unless somebody tells me and shows me with facts and figures that we can't afford it, I'm all in. When do you see all the numbers? Uh, we'll know when we go in for special session. August? Yeah, August. What is the date of that? We don't know when the special session is going to be, but I am guessing it will be during the interims because when they have special session during interims, there's less cost because we're down there anyway. We have heard in regards to the increasing costs of some future obligations that you folks will have, including PEIA, mm -hmm. and that uh, all that has to be factored in. What are uh, the plans for a raise for next year? Is that already set at 5%? My understanding is it's, there's going to be another 5% increase for state employees and teachers. And so that's another obligation that's you'll another have to account obligation. for. We also have the uh, child protective service workers we have to be concerned with. Uh, and we also, we've done some work, but there still needs to be work done with foster care and also with corrections. Any idea what the price tag and all that would add up to? Roughly? No, I don't have those figures. Are well, you looking at four or five hundred million dollars between the raise, PEIA, other items that you mentioned? I think that, well, of course, one of the good things is that unlike the federal government, West Virginia has to balance our budget. Mm -hmm. But we've got a hefty surplus and we also have a special rainy day fund for this uh, income tax reduction. So uh, we'll see what happens. Mr. Stubblefield? Uh, yeah. Uh, you said if we can afford it. And I guess my question is, what is the definition of being able to afford it? Uh, pay raise 5%. Uh, we, we know, though, that we're losing professionals because we cannot pay them enough. That's right. And that's been a consequence of the flatline budget. The flatline budget has had a lot of good aspects to it, but there's been some unintended consequences. So I come back to the question, and I don't have the answer to it, but what do we mean by afford? When do we start trying to pay our workers enough to keep them in the state? Bottom line is we can afford it when we can balance the budget. Uh, that's the first prerequisite. Secondly, uh, it's a it's a balancing act. Uh, how do we take care of all these needs and still send money back to the taxpayers? And that's what we're going to be looking at. Yeah, balance the budget is a little bit different than the second thing you've described. It's easy to balance a budget. Uh, you can do that by squeezing your outflow. But by doing that, then you're, you're cutting back on some of the services that we need to be addressing. 
Well, that's true. You say it's easy to balance the budget. I, I wish the federal government had that same mantra about balancing the budget. We hear a lot on the show about cutting taxes and raising salaries and improving the infrastructure, all these things that are desperately needed within West Virginia. But we hear so little about cutting expenses. And we look around, we've talked a lot about the educational system here where every county has its own superintendent and we've got every, you know, the the county, the state school board. It seems to me that there's an administrative burden mm-hmm. in West Virginia that costs, I'm going to guess, more than a dollar or two that is ripe for some form of cuts that, as I understand it, can't be done because of the constitutional structure of the, of the state. So if we continue to cut taxes and spend more on the things we need to spend, don't we need to start cutting someplace? Don't we need to find those juicy targets to start cutting away? I, I would agree. Um, and this might seem to be a strange segue, but uh, the Attorney General was talking about the Chevron case. Uh, and let me tell you how the Chevron case affects state uh, state government. Uh, we don't have the problems with uh, bureaucracy making rules that aren't approved with state government because in the state of West Virginia, when the legislature passes a law, what happens is by nature uh, and by necessity, the administration has to establish rules to implement that. However, in West Virginia, uh, when the administration creates the rules, those rules then come back to the legislature to look at them. And as the decision is made, are are these rules in line with the intent of the legislature or are they not? And if if not, they either are rejected or amended by the legislature. It would be nice to have that mechanism in place with the federal government, but but we don't. So that helps. But one of the things I've noticed, uh, regardless of agency directors, directives, as far as salaries of at least state employees, I think we have many more state employees than we need to, 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 to do the job. I'd rather have less state employees and have them paid on a much more competitive salary. Larry, you mentioned that administrative costs that went back to the legislators to approve. Uh, does that imply, does that also apply to the State Board of Education? Okay, and that's the point that, that, that I forgot to mention. Thank you, Bill, for that reminder. Every state agency that implements a rule, uh, and it's not about the cost, it's about the intent of the law, uh, that has to be looked over by the legislature. Every state agency has to do that, with the exception of the State Board of Education. We had a constitutional amendment on the, on the uh, ballot uh, to allow the legislature to also oversight with the State Board of Education rules. Unfortunately, it was defeated. Berkeley County, I believe, was the only county that approved it. The other 54 counties voted it down. Larry Kemp, our guest here out of the 94th. Larry, uh, between now and the end of the year, uh, in regards to some things that you haven't mentioned yet, what's important to you to make sure that it gets addressed? One of the things that, uh, not for the end of the year necessarily, but in the last, uh, next session of the legislature, there's an issue that I brought up, oh, in 2012 when I was in the legislature, that I was really concerned about these obscure election dates that people didn't come out for, school levies, uh, city elections, and what have you. I put in a bill, got a hearing. Uh, the the committee on uh, the committee said, oh, we don't want to do that. Uh, and then in 2020, I think it was, uh, Majority leader, leader Amy Summers brought it up again and said, okay, let's get rid of these obscure elections, at least on levies and things of that nature. So that, that, that passed. But we still have these obscure election dates uh, on cities and counties, and we've, uh, or, or cities. We've got in Berkeley County, we've got two municipalities that are incorporated, Hedgesville and Martinsburg. They all both have obscure election dates. When I was in college, I remember it was the Vietnam era. I remember one of the slogans by some of the people opposing the war was, what if we gave a war and nobody came? And with the Berkeley County uh, primary elections and also the Martinsburg City election, uh, that's what happened. It's not a bad reflection on who ran, but it's a reflection on the process. Berkeley County uh, was one of the lowest voter participations in the state. And in Martinsburg, with a population of 19,000, only a couple hundred people voted in the city election. So the legislation that I'm going to be inducing this year is to require 
city elections to be either on primary or state and federal uh, election days, which will do a couple things. It will reduce cost and it also increase voter turnout. Most of the candidates we've spoken to have said they would be in favor of that. If they're already elected, they said they wouldn't stay uh, stand in the way of that happening. It seems to be a good idea, especially when you consider the traditionally low voter turnout in the city of Martinsburg for elections that this year plummeted even to a lower, I think it was a six point something percent. Six turnout. point some odd percent, which is yeah. it's just ridiculous. It's not a reflection on the candidates, but it is a reflection on the system. Yeah, it's not good. Uh, you've got uh, that uh, percentage of people making the decisions for 19,000 people. Even in the county, the county turnout was only 17 point something percent. That's right. Which is also abysmally low. It's, now, one of the reasons, in my opinion, that Berkeley County has such a low voter participation is we are essentially a bedroom community, mm -hmm. uh, commuting. And uh, it's been a couple of years ago, but I saw some statistics that uh, over 60% of the wage earners in Berkeley County work out of state and they commute. So here you have these wage earners coming back after a long day, sometimes late at night, sometimes they work two jobs, sometimes their spouses work two jobs. So it's, I understand why Berkeley County has a low voter turnout, but there's still things that can be done to make the turnout better. Have we heard, <clears throat> you hear this a lot about the low voter turnout? And I, I think it's embarrassing that it's as low as it is. But in the case of Martinsburg, just to keep another perspective, 19,000 people made the decision to let 1.6% of the people, a few hundred people, decide the, their future, right? I mean, it's, it's an active decision. Have we heard anything from people saying, wow, I, <clears throat> excuse me, a significant number of people saying, wow, I wish it wasn't so hard to vote? I wish it was easier to vote. Are we getting those complaints? No, and, and that's a good point. One of the rights we have as citizens to vote is also the right not to vote. Mm -hmm. So if a person decides not to vote, you know, that's, their, that's their decision. Uh, I do think we could make it easier, but uh, uh, quite frankly, I had a lot of people when I asked them, particularly about the Martinsburg City election, they said, oh, there was an election? Because they just weren't aware of it. Uh, and people's lives are busy. I understand that. But uh, but yet you contrast with Shepherdstown, voted at the same time, and that was uh, they had something like 45% that voted. Not a large turnout, but compared to Martinsburg, huge. Shepherdstown did really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and Shepherdstown is much more liberal than I, that, than I would proffer. But I'm proud of Shepherdstown for doing the job they did. Larry, one of your committees is judiciary. That's right. And another one is pensions. Right. Uh, pensions uh, in the state apparently are as healthy as they are in pretty much any state in the country in regards to the funding of these pensions. Better than almost any state. Yeah. Uh, is there a mechanism, and I understand some of these pensions are not just fully funded but overfunded, mm -hmm. is, is, there, is there a mechanism to be able to uh, dial back some of those contributions or divert those to the funds that need um, more of in them? No, there isn't, and that's an in interesting point. One of the things that concerns me is years ago when we had this pension uh, unfunded liability, one of the things the legislature did is to eliminate cost of automatic cost of living adjustment for, for retirees, uh, which means that if you retire from state government, you're fine the first year, but the more years that pass, the less money you make as far as, as, far as actual income uh, with the cost of living. Uh, and I'm very much in agreement uh, of, with all people, Dale Lee and some of the other people with the teachers union and the other teachers, that we need to have a better mechanism for cost of living for retirees. Now, the legislature does every year look back and say, okay, these people that are really, really hurting on pensions, let's say they make less than $1,000 a month, we're going to give them a one-time bump up. But uh, I think retirees really need to have some kind of reasonable cost of living adjustment, particularly the longer they're out as a retiree, the more they're hurting. The the pensions, uh, are, are those checks come from the state. That's correct. And that comes out of state treasury. That's right. Which is taxpayer dollars. That's right. So if you put in a, a COLA, an annual COLA for that, that mm -hmm. would mean you'd also have to collect more money each year to be able to That's pay correct. for that adjustment. That's correct. Right. Has there has there been a fiscal note done on what something like that might cost? Not only is there not a fiscal note, has not been done, but the attitude has been we don't want to change it, leave it alone. 
uh, which I think is a concern. Even though there's a fiscal note and even though we can't maybe do a full cost of living adjustment, we do need to do something. But again, that cuts into the pie of the budget that the legislature has to carve out. Additionally, uh, my understanding is in regards to teacher pensions, we have a teacher shortage in the state and also a shortage of certified teachers in the state. So as we have substitutes, those who have retired and fill roles and are getting paid, we have to cap the number of days that these folks work as substitutes. Uh, that's a state law, as I understand that's it. That's a state law. That's correct. And as they work as teachers, that additional money they earn does not enhance their pension. Right. Correct? That's correct. Do you regard that as an issue? I, I think that's an issue. I, I think we need to expand the ability to uh, replace teachers because we have teachers that are, <clears throat> that, are, that, are, uh, that, are, that are leaving. Also, another issue with uh, state employees and teachers is years ago, uh, if you build up a lot of sick leave, you could take some of that as a credit on your pension benefits. Well, the legislature took that away, and what's happening now is state employees, county employees who are under the pension system uh, are saying, I've got all the sick leave built up. I'm just going to use it uh, as a mental health day. Or as one lady said to me the other day, she said, you know, I've got an eye problem. I can't see coming into work today. <laughs> so yeah. there's, some, there's some things that could be done to, to enhance, the, enhance the system. So is the pension structure, the state pension based on a function of the last three years of income or whatever it is? is, it a, is it? Uh, it's based on, uh, based on a number of variables, and I can't remember exactly what they are off the top of my head. Last five years. Last five yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. And I it's a percentage correct, of that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the number of years of service. Yeah. How long do you have to serve as a delegate before you're eligible for the state retirement? Is it 10 years? Uh, actually, it's eight years. I have opted out of it. I have decided I don't you know, want a pension to, to serve. I I, I just don't think that – I also don't use the uh, the health insurance that's available for, for delegates. I just don't think that uh, a delegate who are citizen legislatures should get those kind of benefits that a full-time employee gets. In your uh, work profession, you worked in the prisons. I worked in the state Maryland uh, correctional system as a uh, prison case manager in the bowels of a uh, high-security prison. Did it for 17 years. Hated every minute of it. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the state of West Virginia's correction system right now, Larry. Some improvements have been made. How much further do we have to go? There have been some improvements made. Uh, among other things, uh, most other states have a 20-year retirement for correctional, not just correctional officers, but correctional classified employees. Uh, West Virginia doesn't have that. One of the things, one of the bills I'm putting in this year is to put in a 20-year retirement system for correctional officers that will cause some more turnover as people leave, but it also, it's been my experience in other states, will also enhance the uh, recruitment of correctional employees. It wouldn't be mandatory after 20 years, correct? No, it would not. And I have some, when I worked in Maryland, they had 20-year retirement for correctional uh, employees, and I knew correctional officers that worked 30 or 40 years. Uh, one of the reasons they did that, because let's say you went to work as a correctional officer at age 21, had a 20-year retirement at 41, well, you can't just live on the retirement, so they took they would take other jobs, or they would just continue to work until they're old enough for Social Security. Mike Height, uh uh, typed in said it's now 10 years for retirement as opposed to five years. Okay. For corrections? For, for every, all state employees. All state employees, all period. 10 years is how you get vested. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, Larry, just about uh, two and a half, three minutes left here. Anything else on your mind important that you want to make sure we address? Uh, just a couple things. Uh, there's a lot of issues going on, so I would uh, encourage people to uh, contact my website, uh, which is compwv.com, or my Facebook page, which is larrycomp.com. In regards to uh, next year, right? you were unopposed? Unopposed. Uh, very very the, unusual for you. Very unusual, because the last time I ran, I had two candidates in the primary. Uh, fortunately, I got about 70% of the vote and won. This year, nobody ran against me. 
Of course, we don't know if somebody's going to petition or be an independent candidate uh, because they have to the end of July to, to file. But so far, I've got smooth sailing as far as the election. And Democrats cannot appoint somebody at this time? No, that, that timeline has passed. That ship has sailed. That ship has sailed. All right. So in regards to the next legislative session, there'll be a new governor. There's going to be some new leadership uh, in different places. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Speaker Hanshaw would like to return to be the speaker again next year. Would you support his bid if he decides to do I would again? support Speaker Hanshaw re- returning. Uh, I have a good relationship with him. Uh, next year, because it's the gubernatorial election year following that, the legislature is a little different. We'll go in for a couple days in January, and then we'll recess until February. And constitutionally, that's so the new incoming governor has a chance to put his budget together and other proposals for the legislature. And then your 60-day session won't end until mid-April. That's right. It'll go a little later this year. Effectively. All right, Larry, what, you're not going to go to Chipotle with Coop, are you, by chance? No, that stuff goes right through me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you were looking for a category of too much information, there maybe you go. that's where you just found it. Uh, right there, man. Well, good to see you, man. Yeah, give our uh, love to Bodacia Cheryl and Bob the Wonder Dog. Yeah. Bodacia Cheryl, otherwise known as Lucy. Lucy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a story there, too, and it has something to do with your previous comment as well, as I understand it, uh, too, Larry.